Achtung, Achtung. Hier ist die Sendestelle Berlin im Voxhaus. Meine Damen und Herren, noch keine Klärung. Der Mord in West End. Welcome to Achtung History Series 2. The Watcher. Produced by the Berlin Tour Guide and presented by Simon J. James. Subscribe to the Arctung History Podcast on all major podcasting platforms and follow Arctung History on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Arctung History. Or visit the Berlin Tour Guide.com forward slash Arctung History for updates. If you wish to support Arctung History, you can do so through Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Arctung History. This is The Watcher. Episode 7, The Final Alibis. Monday brought new air to the city. Suddenly winds blew the Baltic breezes from the Ostsee down and over the lands of northern Germany. With little in their way... They blew over the lakes of Mecklenburg and through the rolling forested landscape of the Uckermark and Mittelmark of Brandenburg. Monday also brought, for most people within the city, a return to the working week, and the city in the early hours of the working day was filled with the movements of its citizens, old and new, on their routines, traversing the growing Hauptstadt by automobile, tram, train, Stadtbahn, Ringbahn, U-Bahn and omnibus. Ringbahn trains were crowded, and many whom could not squeeze within the confines of the wooden carriages, let alone sit upon one of the bench seats polished by the arses of the nation, hung on the running boards. That although was certainly not allowed, and was cleared before a train departed a station, was thronged with the rush of people jumping on as the trains departed the stations to the displeasure of the guards. Such recklessness had only seven years prior, on the day of Walter Rathenau's funeral, the gunned down foreign minister, led to the deaths of 45 people, who, whilst riding the running boards, were knocked off by a fellow running board traveller on an opposing train who carried in his rucksack a long pole that as one train passed a train running in the opposite direction, swiped those clinging on from their footings, killing eighteen instantly, and many others later. But little stopped the great machine. For Quoss and Werneberg, who had both been able to take some rest on the previous day, they were also back on the beat. The previous day, Sunday the 18th, had been for the skeleton staff, and lowly members of the Zeppenik Murder Commission to work, but they had not been quiet. At the briefing on the Monday morning at the Alex, there was much to catch up on. Gannat was analysing the typed and signed testimonies of Marta Schultz, wife of the currently still confined to a cell of the Alex watcher, Richard Schultz, and also of her father, the roofer, Paul Schiemann. They were cross-checking the statements which revealed that there was certainly some secrets that surrounded the watcher Schultz. For one, despite his admittance that on the day of the disappearance and subsequent murder of Hildegard Zeppenich of Neuwestend, Schultz had indulged in drinking at least two bottles of beer. But it seemed that the father-in-law did not know that Schultz himself even drunk. There was also a lot of gaps in the testimonies towards the difficult history of the guard Schultz especially his mental health. There seemed a reasonable concern that the mental health of Watcher Schultz was unsound and unpredictable. Contradictory statements made by the wife, who, it was noted, made clear what she was telling was the truth, therefore casting much more suspicion on what she had to say, meandered from statements that her husband is a good man to a violent temperament acknowledged his interest in books of a moral character and had a penchant to drink too much, hallucinates and is known to wander off without the recollection of doing so. It was George Ross who was to be in charge of the investigating the reports from the Kriegsversorgungsamt at the Brummybrucker, easily reachable from the Alex with the number 91 tram that followed the Kuppernickerstrasse. 
for the rest in the meeting room, there were papers to read to gather what the press were reporting. It was always important to keep on top of the wanderings of the imagination of the press, especially when they forgot their place as a news outlet and anthropomorphized into a person. But it was a Monday, and the day's papers would not be released until the evening, so it only left the Sunday editions to be perused. The Berliner Volkszeitung was receiving information from somewhere within the Alex, and its previous day's press was quite revealing of the information so far gathered, and even cast doubt onto the character of Schultz as a perpetrator of the crime. Who is the lust killer? It questioned in bold black italic script, before going on to write, the terrible murder of little Hildegard Zepernick has still not been resolved. The building guard of Richard Schultz, who is still being held in the police headquarters and has been questioned many times, has spoken to little Hilda on many occasions. But on the day of Hildegard's disappearance, he said that he didn't see the child. He was on the construction site, just at the time the terrible act must have happened. Richard Schultz is 40 years old, and has four children himself. Witnesses saw how he once gave little Hilda his picture, but that he had wanted a kiss from the little one, but she ran away. Schultz is supposed to be harmless to children, as he is very fond of them. He has an eye injury in the war, and is a little strange. Yesterday afternoon, the whole block of houses was searched with dogs. Every patch of earth searched for a trace of the perpetrator, for the shovel with which the child was buried but nothing was found. Whomever the leak within the Alex was, they were revealing almost everything that the murder commission was doing and had. They did not know which was more embarrassing, the leak or that the leak revealed so little, as they so far had come to naught in many of the areas of the investigation. If they were going to build a case against Schultz, as they now intended, they were going to need a lot more character information, hence the requirement to send George Ross to the Brummybrooker. Their best course of action, in the event, if little more evidence was found, it was decided, was to prove all alibis of the workers and through a process of elimination only leave Schultz left as the only credible person to have perpetrated the crime of the murder of Hildegard Zeppernick. The next point of the morning's briefing was a new incentive. 500 Reichsmarks had been initially issued as a means of hoping to draw forward people who might have information on firstly the disappearance and later the murder of Hildegard Zeppernick. Kwas and Wernerberg had received permission from higher up the chain to increase the amount. From 500 Reichsmarks, it was doubled to a 1,000, a substantial increase which of course, did not come without its drawbacks. It invited more people to point fingers in desperation to clinch at the money on offer, but it might also bring shreds of information that witnesses may have seen but discounted as nothing but, in the hopes of a significant financial reward, may finally report. The information of the increase in financial reward was printed within the internal police news, the Deutsche Kriminalpolizeiblatt. The investigation, with the transient nature of the city, was having to spread across the nation. However, there was much work to be done at home. There were still many to speak to on the construction site, and most importantly, the movements of those who had drank in the Boudicca to trace. Gannat wanted as many pieces of information and precise movements as could be gathered before he, himself, was to interview Richard Schultz again, so Quas and Werneberg dispatched their teams across the city. So as the citizens traversed their daily morning rituals to the jobs of stockbrokers at the Börse, factory workers in the Siemensstadt, shop clerks on the Friedrichstrasse, so did the Zeppernick Murder Commission investigators travel amongst them, in the automobiles of the Alex. Quas and Werneberg themselves were also about to leave until they were informed that a young girl of the West End district had made herself present at the Alex and, according to a secretary, may have had valuable information on the watcher, Richard Schultz. They themselves had much to be done, so they assigned the task to the criminal assistant, Dittmar. 
She was 13 years old, and to any 13-year-old, the Rotenberg, the Alex, would have been an impressive, if repressive, building. Its brick Gothic structure, reminiscent of the Teutonic castle at Marienburg, and its corridors, the cloisters of Lenin and Corin. Perhaps it was the impressive nature that the structure oppressed over those within that caused the 13-year-old girl to be somewhat distracted. It could also have been the irrational fear that came with speaking with the criminal assistant Dittmar. Erika Timmler, born June 1st, 1916 in Strasbourg, Berlin, Westendale, 91. She answered to the, as ever, formulaic beginnings of the statement taking of Who are you? When and where were you born? And where do you reside? Prussian efficiency in all corners of the Prussian establishment. Okay, Fräulein Timmer, what do you have to say? asked the commissar. It's about the Monday. The Monday Hilda disappeared, she answered timidly, as she rotated her head gazing at the corners of the room. On you go then, Dittmar pressed the distracted girl. I can still think exactly of Monday because on this day, Hilda Zepinik disappeared. Hilda, I, and other girls stood together with the guard. The watcher Schultz, Dittmar interrupted. Erika nodded. He had his dog with him in front of the Zepinik house. He told us about the war and bombs and other things to do with the war. I'm not sure what, when this happened. I only know that Hilda was there and that afterwards Hilda was playing on the trellis. Hilda's mother called to her to get down. Afterwards, my mother called me, and then I was back on the street, but I went back in the direction of Heerstrasse to a friend who lives there. How would you describe the watcher Schultz? He was the guardian with the glass eye, always nice to us. We were, all, we were allowed to play on the building, but the other guard would chase us away. I don't think he really knew me because I was away on vacation for a time. Was he attracted to Hilda? Did he like her? I, I can't say. He was silly with everyone. How did he call you? Did he know your names? No, he, he didn't remember our names, but he always had such strange names for us. What did he call Hildegard? He called Hilda Hilla or Zippelchen. The girl's focus wandered away. What did you do on the construction site? Play? Play and collect bottles that we would take to Nietzsche's? Were you ever in the guard hut with the watcher Schultz? She shook her head. The other guard was my friend. Flader? The criminal assistant questioned. He would occasionally give us the Juno pictures. Did the guards ever try to kiss you? I never got a kiss from any of the guards. Did any of the others, Fräulein Timmer? Dittmar asked irritably as the girls lost focus. Erika? Hmm? Did any of the others receive kisses from the guards? I don't know. You said you were in front of the Zepinik residence when you spoke with the watcher Schultz. Was he often there? With his dog? Yes. Why do you think that was? Because there are so many children there, I think. Dittmar's superiors, the commissars Quas and Werneberg, were, with the books found at the Rummelsberg residence, with the statements of the wife and a child of the area getting a picture that this guard, this watcher Schultz, had a penchant for children. Thank you, Erica. Could you remain here just a few moments? We'll have your statement typed up, and if you could sign it after reading it. The girl was already again looking at something on the walls, invisible to every eye but her own. However, after the secretary had typed the interview on the waxy paper, so thin it did little to obscure the vision used by the police presidium either because of Prussian frugality or because of some other more scientific reason, the girl did sign it. Afterwards, Dittmar had the paper rolled back into the typewriter and left a note at the bottom of the page. Timler was questioned on record, as it could be important to state that she had spoken to the guard for the rest, the child does not make an unbelievable impression, but the statements appeared to be rather uncertain and confused. It was striking that she was easily distracted. Under this note, Dittmar left his own signature. Rosser had to wait before he departed. 
He needed a letter from the commissars that would allow him, they hoped, access to the Schultz's records at the Kriegsversorgungsamt at the Bromibrucker. It was an informal approach, but one that was necessary to greatly expedite the process of paperwork that often weighed down the investigators and often could grind an investigation quickly to a halt. Once Quoss and Wernerberg were ready, they typed up the letter and were sure to contain as much information within it as possible to reduce the request for further information, thereby slowing it down. However, the request, as they typed it, was the first time that they admitted that Schultz was the culprit that had committed the heinous deed. What's your tag number? the commissars asked of Rosser. 933, why? You have it on you? I do. Every officer within the police of the free state of Prussia was required to carry their identity disc, an oval piece of stamped metal, an idealized view of some hills with a sword carrying Prussian eagle flying above the etching of the letters that spelt out Berlin on one side and the identifying number on the other. Other cities varied in their etchings. You are to obtain the files, Rosser. If you can't, you must insist to inspect them and take notes. The more insights we get could be invaluable and could lead to some important conclusions about the intellectual and other characteristics of Schultz. Got it? I do, sir. Off you go. With that, Rosser was dispatched, and now Quoss and Wernerberg could get to their investigations. They drove first to Schunneberg, to Feuerigstrasse 37, and interviewed the old guard Flada, the one that was friends with Erika Timler. He told them of the events of the evening of the 12th after he had arrived at the Gilbau early. Did you notice anything about Schultz in the days after she went missing? He seemed normal to me. Calm, objective, nothing suspicious. I assumed she were already buried when I arrived, Flado explained without being asked. I also assume it wasn't a stranger like the papers were saying. Why do you think this, Herr Flado? A stranger would have simply thrown the body into a cellar and run away. As I heard it, little Hilda was missing from around half past six and later Schultz was asked to have the building searched, but he rejected the request. Do you know anything about Schultz and giving photographs to the children? I found out from Schultz that he had given the photographs he had taken across the park at the shop away. He didn't tell me why, but he explained to me he spent his time when he was bored with the children. A few of the ladies of the area had complained to me about it, and later, after the girl disappeared, I found out from some of the residents that he had asked a few of the children to kiss him. But he never mentioned that to me. Anything else about Herr Schultz you can mention that stands out to you? I found him on the ground once, having convulsions not long after he started. He said he felt them coming on and could take medication from a doctor to stop them. At Neuwestend, Quas and Wernerberg spoke with Hilda Gerica, whom they asked over the information that Erika Timmler had told Dittmar earlier that morning at the Alex. But the account of the distracted girl could not be substantiated with the girl who lived opposite the Zeppeniks. When asked about the conversation that Erika Timmler had mentioned about the war and bombs, she had said, I know nothing of this, that the guard with the glass eye stood in front of the Zeppenik's apartment then, but I did hear that the guardian with the glass eye asked a kiss from a child. She also denied ever going onto the grounds of the Gilbaum or being on friendly terms with either of the guards. The investigators had been busy when Quas and Wernerberg were finally able to arrive at the Gilbaum. With a return to the normal working week schedule, the people to which the investigators, criminal secretaries, and criminal assistants were eager to speak to. Amongst the dust that blew across the open construction site were the southerly winds that jaded their shoes that had been shined to a mirror, a far cry from the working boots and the wooden clogs that some still wore that bore the strains and scuff marks of a manual job. The members of the murder commission Zeppenik had been busy. They had gathered not only information on some workers, but also had found the workers that, from the morning briefing, Quas and Wernerberg had made it apparent they were eager to speak to. They were the last group in need of alibis, and if they were able to discount them, suspicion would rest almost entirely on the watcher Schultz.
To aid in the investigation by the members of the Zeppenik Murder Commission, Wernerberg that morning had drawn up a framework. It was a framework that would provide consistency amongst all of the interrogators and allow for swifter filing and better understanding of the information and was created in such a way that even the inexperienced of the commission could ask all of the relevant questions. It even instructed them to mention the reward. He had had the framework duplicated and a copy handed out at the briefing to all investigators. Now, thanks to this, they had before them a lineup of workers including who, individually, might not be able to lay all of the facts and events before them, but together, and with the information they had already gathered, they could build the greater picture. The clock turned free on a day he had been feeling particularly lazy. Mondays were days he struggled with often. Sun broke down heavily on the garden outside of the hut that he called home, home to his wife and his four children. His children had already been to school and returned to the house, and now it was his turn to leave. His shift swapped regularly with his colleague, but neither the early shift or the late was agreeable. The early shift beginning in the late afternoon, and the late beginning even in the summer months after the sun had descended and the last light faded from the sky. Both shifts meant that he had to often sleep during the day. He left for the door and silently picked up the backpack that he carried with him. He was only recently returned to work, and the routine was still fresh, but his wife had packed within it a breakfast, to be had when most families were preparing their dinner. He could also feel the weight of the insulated container to which his wife had poured some coffee into. He didn't bother to pack a book this day. He instead decided that he'd buy a newspaper on his way. He walks in the sun slowly, direct light often hurt his eye and could lead to headaches that were unwelcome. Despite only having been recently employed, he had become a man of habits and on the days he was to take the early shift, he would arrive at the station at almost precisely the same time to board the same train and take a seat in the carriage where cloth covered the wooden seats. The train that traversed through the city, through the ring in the Stadtbahnhof at Stralau Rummelsburg, past the rail yards of Warschauer Strasse and Schlesisches Bahnhof, and into the city, the Stadtbahn trundled. From Janowitzbrucke to Alexanderplatz, the view through the windows to the east were of one solid red brick building, the windows of which provided a glimpse into the lives of those that worked inside those employed by the Prussian state police. Then the train followed the meanderings of the old river long since sacrificed for the building of rail lines and skirted the limits of the old city, through the Borsa, Friedrichstrasse, Leerte, Bellevue, Bahnhofs, the magnificent garden of the Tiergarten stretching back towards the Brandenburger Tor, where in the summer sun the gilded dome of the Reichstag and the golden lady of victory shone close by. Finally, after passing through the stations of the relatively newer part of Berlin, he arrived at Bahnhof West End, from which he had a 15-minute walk ahead of him before he arrived at the Gilbao. A check of the watch and the bell was rung. It was the end of the working day, four o'clock. With the ringing of the bell, workers were ordered to lay down their tools where they were working, it did not matter if it was on sand, concrete, or wooden boards. The tools were to be laid down for the day and only be picked up when work resumed the next. Steuer stood at the foreman's hut, his finger on the button to sound the bell, and signed the workers out, ticking next to their names so he knew when he had to report to the Ernst Gill, the building owner, how many hours had been worked. Only a contractor was left unloading stone. He took the names next to Heimer, Barnemann, Engler, Gastler, and the Ricks amongst the other 140 workers, most proceeding straight out of the gate to make their ways home along with the rest of a city. Others opted to hang back, to stand around, hold union meetings, kick the dust, have some beer in the Boudicca, or as Steuer planned to do, have a beer at the Klauser on the Reichstrasse at Bahnhof Neuwest End. Eichberg and Kandala found him, with his book marking the workers out. You coming, Ferdinand? they asked of Steuer. 
Go ahead, I'll catch up with you there. As you wish. And they left for the Kneipe. Now that work had finished, Max Heimer and Hans Jan decided to have a scour of the construction site for bottles. If they brought enough back, they could hope to get a beer or two from the Boudicca in exchange. They decided between them that Jan would search the building and Heimer the area around the fence and exterior. As he walked around the fence, he could see the workmen leaving the site. The tools left on the ground in their unusual mess with no designated workman at the end of the day to go around the site and put things away. Otto Rich stood amongst a group of other construction workers. Half an hour later, and with an armful of empty beer bottles, Heimer and Jan had collected all that they could carry and walked back towards the Boudicca. They nodded to Steuer and Follack, who were themselves finally leaving the building site, having completed their jobs, the site now in the hands of the watchman. Heimer pulled the door of the Boudicca open, and the small kniper on the building site already had a number of workers drinking within. Inside the air was acrid with a mixture of Berlin smoking Juno and the Engelhardt, Kindle, Schulli brands of Pilsner being absorbed by the sun-kissed workmen who preferred the hydration of beer over that of water. Heimer nodded and said hello and scanned the room, seeing the faces of Emil and Willy Barnemann, Engler, Hans Jan, Willy Gronau, the Brothers Rich, Gansko and Gastler. Gastler, Heimer noted, was very much fond of the beer this day and was happily supping at the glass bottles, draining them quicker than the others around. Heimer handed over the glass bottles empty of their contents and ordered a beer for himself and sat down to rest, but he did not get long to do so. Gronau and Jan, who were in charge of the Boudicca, knew the workers didn't often stay long and did not wish to remain open too much longer, and they still needed to do another sweep of the building for any other bottles, forgotten in dark corners, and just half an hour later, at five, they were turfed out to drink on the steps. Eichberg and Kandala were already enjoying a beer at Zerklauser on the Reichstrasse as they waited on Steuer and Follack. Zerklauser was one of the new builds on the square, a square so new, in fact, that currently it was the only building completely finished. The Kneipe was like most other affairs in Berlin, only newer, but it still had the atmosphere of the older counterparts. Small and long, built on a corner, it was true, as the Berliners would say, an Eck Kneiper. Dark panelled walls, wooden furniture, none of the modern fancy chromium affair, simple and traditional, and it served cold beer and schnapps. What more could the workers of a building site wish for after a hard day back at work, after the joys of a weekend? Groner and Jan returned half an hour after they had left, after picking up the final bottles on the building site. They unlocked the door and let the still thirsty workmen in. Gastler, however, was already showing signs that he had had a little too much to drink. Wilhelm, can we go? asked Otto of his brother Wilhelm. What? Why? It's still early, Wilhelm replied. As he did so, a new figure entered the Boudicca. The watchman Schultz had entered. Come on, let's go, Otto pleaded. No, it's already half past six, Otto said, covering the face of his watch. It is, came Wilhelm's reply with shock. Nah, I'm only joking. It's only just after half past five, Otto laughed at the expense of his brother. But as he did so, he caught sight of Gansko leaving the door. But as Gansko left, and to the eyes of Otto Rich disappeared in the direction of Nietzsche's on West End Alley. Another round on me, three more, Gastler slurred as he tried to order another three beers for himself and the Rich brothers. Heimer, already having a full bottle in his hand, did not need one, but he still felt that he should include the watchman, who was relatively new to the building site, and it didn't hurt to make a few more friends. Get the watchman a beer, let him drink too, Heimer said. Gastler nodded drunkenly. Or was it even a nod? It might just have been a slouch of the head. Nevertheless, Gastler, inebriated, stood and ordered four beers from Grunau, who dutifully handed them the bottles and noted it down on the piece of paper lined with tally marks drawn under names that he had ordered four beers. No, Gastler said, pointing with his finger to the lines beneath his name. I only pay for three beers, not four. I don't know him. 
It's the guard Schultz, Wilhelm Rich said, nodding towards a figure that was leaning in the doorway. He's been here at least a month. The guard Schultz remained quiet. The three beers that Gastler had purchased were placed before himself and the Rich brothers, and the fourth beer, Hyman noted with a glance at the tally, remained on the account of Gastler. The bottle was slowly passed along the room to the guard Schultz, who silently took it and began drinking. Gansker had met with the construction worker Possel as he left the construction site of the Gilbaum. They'd walked to the Reichstrasse and then towards the Klauser Kneipe. Inside the dark and smoky bars they entered, they could see Follack, Eichberg, Steuer and Kandala sitting within. A few empty glasses of beer in front of them equaled in number with Schnapp's glasses. Steuer looked over. He hadn't spoken to Gansker about joining them at the bar, it was much too late after their own arrival for the other foreman to have followed them to the bar, so he simply concluded that it was a coincidence. After all, in a district that was still being built, the very reason for their presence in the vicinity, there was very little option. It was a far cry from the Scheunenfittel or Friedrichshain, both areas of high-density living and where Kneipen stood on many corners. So new the Klauser was itself, it was yet to build the clientele to have a typical Stammtisch, a table reserved for the most haggard of persistent locals who had drunk away wars, empires and disasters within the oaken walls of the Kneipen. Even Napoleon had relaxed in a Kneipen, the Letzen instance that stood against the walls of the old city after his capture of the capital of Prussia in 1806. Such was the importance of the Kneipen to the historic fabric. Gansko and Possel sat not at the same table as their colleagues, but at one in the near. Eicherberg, who had brought with him, direct from the slaughterhouse, a few sausages, asked the proprietor to heat them up. Once the dish of sausages returned to their table, they were distributed amongst the workers, and Steuer handed a couple to Gansko and Possel. He had drunk the beer fast. The brown glass bottle that he had held towards the light showed only the slimmest of lines where the remaining beer sloshed at the bottom of the bottle. As he drank the remaining liquid, he rummaged in the pocket of his work clothes and brought out a few fenning coins that had gathered at the bottom. Holding them flat in his hand, he mentally calculated how much he had left and how much he could afford. Heimer watched him all the while. Ignoring the argument that had suddenly erupted between Hans Jan, Emil Barnemann, and Engler, he watched as Schultz ordered two more bottles of beer and a packet of cigarettes and paid. He wasn't a construction worker, therefore he was not allowed the same privilege that the construction workers enjoyed of having a tally tab. Schultz picked up the bottles, pocketed the cigarettes, and walked out without a sound. By the time that Heimer had watched Schultz leave with his bottles and cigarettes, the argument between Barnemann, Engler, and Hans Jan had come to a close, and Barnemann and Engler, infuriated, left. Not long after, at quarter past six, Hans Jan also left. Gastler had drunk too much, and too quick. When it came for the three to leave, only a short time after the others, and with the persistence of Gronau, who had been left to lock up the Boudicca, Gastler, in his drunken stupor, had to be heaved to his feet by the brothers Rich. Outside of the Boudicca, with the door now locked, Gronau bid the brothers farewell, and headed to the gate. Be seeing you, Gronau, the brothers called after Gronau. It would take them a little longer to leave with the figure of Gastler slumped in between them, his arms thrown over their shoulders as they walked towards the gate. As they approached the gate, they could see that the guard Schultz was waiting. See you, he spoke roughly as he let them pass. Otter Rich looking past the guard to see several children playing around the embankment of the site. See you, the brothers said in return with strain from the weight of the inebriated Gastler strung between them. They stepped onto the train at Neuvest End with Gastler, but the brothers left Gastler at Schönhauser Tor, Kwas and Werneberg explained to their superior Ernst Gnatt as they slotted the pieces together. Wilhelm Rich asked the gentleman to awake Gastler if he happened to fall asleep when he was at the correct stop, which apparently, according to Gastler, the gentleman did, and we confirmed the alibi of Gastler with his wife that he did return quite drunk and had an argument with his wife because he was not sober. The Rich brothers were witnessed arriving home by the daughter of the porter around the time of eight in the evening. That's the Rich brothers and Gastler crossed off. 
and those in the Kneipe. Engler and Barnum are left aside. They entered the Klauser for a beer, but only after the other workers had left. There they drank a Moller, then traveled to Barnhof West End by foot and were on their way home at half past eight. Heimer, Gronau, and Jan saw the brothers Rich at the station and Barnumer and Engler in the Klauser, but they, Heimer, Gronau, and Jan traveled with the U-Bahn to Alexanderplatz, where they exited. Uh, Jan ate a Schweinbraten, which he purchased for one mark ten, and a roll of bread for thirty pfennigs. Gronau, who lives at 75 Neue Königstrasse, went home, as did Jan and Heimer. Those who had been in Zerklause previous to Barnumann and Engler left. Names, Gennett asked. Uh, Steuer, Follack, Eicherberg, Kandala, and Possel. They all took the bus to Wittenbergplatz, Bahnhof, and there they separated. Gansko, Kandala, and Possel took the lines towards Hallisch's tour. Uh, they exited afterwards as they, uh, the elevated station of Iranienstrasse, then took the line either 55 or 93 to their apartment. So everyone has an alibi, Gnat rhetorically pondered. Except one, the watcher, Schultz. One more point, Quas stopped the great man from pondering things he already knew the answer to. When we interviewed Hans Jan, he said that the day following Hildegard's disappearance and murder, the watcher, Schultz, asked him if he had seen his boots, his pantines, Somehow he had come to lose them and asked for Jan's help in the search for their return. Jan found them. Oh, and where were they? Outside the window where Hilda was found. I spoke with Schultz today and with no other person to be suspected, even with the little evidence against him. I will ask District Court Councillor Leuventhal to issue an arrest warrant to charge him with the murder of Hildegard Zeppelin. Across the centre from the Alex, beyond the banks of the River Spray and the Stadtbahn line, lies the Charity Hospital Complex, a facsimile of Gothic architecture within walled green surroundings. The hospital founded by the first king in Prussia was constructed to fight against the plague. Across its history, though, it had produced some of the greatest scientific minds the world had ever seen. Robert Koch had identified the, the causative agents of tuberculosis and cholera. Von Bering had understood the causes of diphtheria, and Robert Virchow the beginnings of what would become pathology. It was here, in a clean, sterilized room, upon a slab of marble, Professor Dr. Strauch, stood silently as a man tall with hair once groomed, now mottled and ragged, a moustache in need of trimming, and eyes faded, stood and nodded. That's my daughter. I know it is impolite, but can you explain to me what you recognise? I know her features, her cheeks, her blonde hair, and he looks at the clothes laid alongside the body. Her clothes. Thank you, Herr Zeppenick. Wilhelm Zeppenick left. He had last seen his daughter at lunch over two weeks prior, and the last time he would ever see her was cold and dead on a slab of marble in a room with no soul. Professor Dr. Strauch sat and typed a note to be sent to Ernst Gannett, head of the murder commission, Zeppenick. Father confirms identity. Initial examination shows there is a blow to the head, unreported previously. Achtung, Achtung. Hier ist die Sendestelle Berlin im Voxhaus. Meine Damen und Herren, auf der Suche nach Hildegard Zeppelin. This has been Achtung History's The Watcher, produced by the Berlin Tour Guide and presented by Simon J. James. Follow Arctung History on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Arctung History. Visit the website at theberlintourguide.com forward slash Arctung History and support Arctung History on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Arctung 
history. 